Let's welcome up Mary Sweeney. Woo! Patricia Arquette. Bill Coleman. And Balthazar Gillis. like to kind of hear the impressions the three of you guys had the first time you read this script. Does anything pop in mind? Uh, I was because I'm phobic about nudity. Even at home, I like to take baths in the dark. So I thought this really could be the scariest movie I've ever seen to me. Besides, I'm not exactly sure what it is, but I already believed in David's vision and uh, I was really thrilled to work with them and then these guys and I was like so excited. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that I uh, I read it and I uh, I think I understood it entirely. And then from that time forward I lost my impression of clarity. <laughs> 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 but I remember distinctly saying to my agent that I she said, Wow, it's a wild <laughs> We're going to come back to that. <laughs> wow. Um, should I, I feel like now I should introduce no. Oh, yeah, yeah. Actually, <laughs> I, it would help for the camera. Yeah. Uh, no. Still it? Oh, hey. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, to be honest, I never knew how scary it was going to be when I read it. I mean, it, it was always completely out there. And, I still don't really know what it's about, you know? <laughs> I honestly don't. I'm not sure I even saw it. I don't know if you cutting uh, the neck, I don't know. I think once I died, I, my, I don't know that I watched it after. <laughs> I just watched the last 10 minutes for the first time. Um, it's pretty cool. I think, I think it holds up. <laughs> so this... This screening experience was really uh, special for me because I, I've seen the film so many times on my own that actually having this communal experience helped to really bring out the humor in the film, which I think can often be lost because it's otherwise so intense and, and pretty terrifying. So I was curious to know for, for you know for the three of you uh, who watched the whole thing, what um, what what stuck, what what sort of struck you about uh, about seeing it again, you know, so many years later. I'm just going to defer to you guys. Um, for me, um, I don't even know if I ever really saw it all the way through because of my nudity phobia. I mean, I, even now, I would like to try to block other people's eyes. <laughs> but anyway, uh, what held up for me was at a certain point in shooting, I was like, I come up with this philosophy that. Um, that this was really about misogyny and about jealousy and that this, you know, other k demonic character was like, that you welcome into your home, into your life, is like jealousy. And the evil of jealousy, and then when that bleeds on itself, and, 
And I felt like in watching this movie, even, I can't remember what the name of the song is, when he's, when Pete's looking over the, the backyard fence, the musical, and I don't remember, but I know the words in my head, and it's just music, and it's basically supporting that theory. So, as I watched this movie again with that philosophy that he married a girl, he hated video, who used to be a porn star, she probably, she wanted out of his marriage, blah, blah, blah. Um, it seemed like jealousy. And it, I think they ever wrote this during the time that O.J. Simpson was Nicole Simpson, did he do it, did he not do it? And I don't know if he even at a certain point remembered doing it. Sort of like you wake up and you're someone else or something. So in watching it, I felt like, oh yeah, okay, it's all fitting into place. Yeah, okay, my, my theory works. <laughs> I remember, because um, we didn't rehearse it any Anything with you because we're the same but different. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember, Patricia, that that whole because we would go up to the Fred Madison house to rehearse it, this, you know, had been in the process of uh, being made, and and uh, David had two things that I remember that he want he would well, three things. One, he would really wanted to tell us that we had to get out of the trailers on time because we didn't have a lot of money to make this movie. And you re remember that? He was really focused on telling us we couldn't really take the time to kind of dally. And we had never, it was not like we had any reputation for that shit. It was really, was, that was serious. It was very important. And then I remember him also um, saying that uh, he, one word, there was a song, that song that he played, uh, that, that, remember that, that the girl sings? Uh, do you remember the song? He said, this is, the movie is really in the song. <coughs> listening to the song. And then the third thing was he said, I'm going to read you the definition of the word from the DSM, the, I think it's called the Diagnostic uh, Manual, the, and it's like, yeah, a psychi uh, you know, psychiatrist gives it. And it was, the definition was for psychogenic fugue. <laughs> and I don't, I, you, what? Well, yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was a, you know, in that DSM, they're all the illnesses are numbered, and uh, I forget what the number for that illness was, but he read the number and waited, you know, the way David can read a number and it feels thunderous, <laughs> <laughs> and then read the, the definition, and that felt thunderous. And there was no explication after that. that I think I got scared <laughs> right around that. I went into my own view. <laughs> that what I want you to do. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess I should say something now. Um, <laughs> I'm just kind of tripping out. We've never done this before. I haven't seen Bill in probably 15 years, Patricia emailed me earlier. Uh, somehow somebody said, because they're doing a screening of Lost Highway, you guys, do you want to come down? So we've actually never done this. I haven't seen you in many years. It's great to see you. I forgot how funny mm -hmm. you are. It's <laughs> 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 really good to see you, man. Um, and you too, man. Uh, it's just a, a, a bit of a shock um, to be here. <laughs> I can remember um, in rehearsals, I don't know if you remember this, if I just invented it, but he um, made us, one of the hardest things to do, even with somebody you love deeply, is to look them directly in the eye for an extended period of time, you know? It's, and he made, I don't know if you remember, but he made us do that early on in, um, in rehearsal. It's pretty scary to just sit across from somebody. And we had grown up together a little bit. Her brother and I were, we were in a rap group together. When we were 14, <laughs> the 13th floor, by the way. Um, <laughs> and um, so we had known each other, but not that well, you know. I think I had a big crush on you, and then suddenly I was, you know, had to stare in your eyes for 
longer than I was comfortable doing. <laughs> I remember uh, another thing that David did with us that was really interesting was uh, he was listening to some music during the shot, during the scene, especially the stuff with us at home. And he kept saying, take longer, take longer, take longer. And usually, and especially with a TV, whatever. So I was like, go faster, go faster, go faster. The scene's too long. And he goes, I was like, take longer, longer. Almost like a somnambulistic. I was like, oh my God, we can't go any, take any more time than this. Longer, longer. And he was listening to this like music in his head. And I think it got this weird vibe between them because their marriage was like really uncomfortable. And that it was an abnormal meter. Yeah. Yeah, I remember uh, sometimes the length between the delivery of lines would get so long that you would kind of trance out. And like that dialogue we have in the bedroom where it's the, the two cups. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I mean, it's such a good soundtrack, man. Yeah. Yeah. I remember um, at one point talking about the lighting. Uh, it was one of those going down the dark hall. And, and they were like, oh, no, no, David, that wasn't good for us. I said, no, it's better, it's better. And they said, no, if you went inside, minimum focus. What are you talking about? You know, she's soft in some places. What do you mean? So she comes in, focus, out of focus, great printing. David was really also very open to mistakes, happy mistakes, and the art revealing itself, and the crew really brought to the table because he opened up the environment so much to that. But what another thing I noticed tonight that I didn't notice was, and maybe I noticed it when we first read it, it could be like a classic film noir in a weird kind of a way, and it could be delivered like that. But his pacing and the way he chose and the way he directed you was kind of against that to some extent, um, even though visually maybe in some ways it was. But the acting it was a little more modern of an interpretation. Well, you know, the other song that, I, that really um, stayed with me was the uh, Rammstein, which I became obsessed with shortly thereafter. Um, so, but this is a little bit... Uh, I mean, it's, uh, it still has a beautiful score by it, by the way, So I'm curious to know a little bit about the incorporation of all of this music uh, into the soundtrack and, and having to work between the song and the score. Um, well, I think it was involved in licensing all the music. And, um, and I just remember, we, you know, we, uh, we dealt with this guy in England who um, had a record label, and he introduced us to Barry Adamson who um, was very early um, sampling and mixing, and, and it, you know, we, had, we were discovering how to license sampled songs, which is a nightmare. But, um, and we worked, we made the soundtrack um, with, on Trent Reznor's label, Interscope, so we were working with Trent, and Trent brought um, Marilyn Manson into it, you know, with really great tunes of his, and, um, and then he also did a song, but he gave it to us so late that we almost had no room anywhere for it. Uh, and and um, Joey Horton did a great song too. And Angelo, you know, it, it, it's a lot more licensed music than normally. Uh, you know, and David and Angelo work together. And um, I am not really sure how we got going down that path. It was just that um, we just kept finding great licensed music and it kept finding a place in the film. And so it really became a dominant. And I'm Deranged was just too perfect a song, you know. That was kind of early on to, to enhance it. And that was, I think, a song that David Bowie was just coming out with at the time that we went to New York and met with him. And I think we, you know, um, got it before it was even published. I'm not sure. I mean, before the album was published. But that was my trip. He would play, you know, he would, if you don't know this about David, he years ahead of time, and it's actually playing up until you speak, you know, the music would play, and then right before you start speaking, you know, they cut it off, obviously. Um, but a lot of that music, we approached everything, uh, David and me, we always started with a song, and we would sit in my car and listen to so much music, and as an actor, I always kind of identify music with, with whatever project I'm doing, and that was so amazing to have the song blasting there. Uh, you know, on set, and so, I mean, he almost directs, right, Mary? I mean, he almost directs to the rhythm of, of at least in, in Lost Highway, a lot, a lot of his films. So, uh, what I love about this film and, and other films that David's done is the very kind of eclectic casting. And uh, besides Belize, I mean, specifically bringing in people like Robert Blake, Richard Pryor, my doppelganger, Gary Busey. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm curious if you'll talk a little bit about, um, first of all, how you guys first got involved, and then, you know, as a producer, you know, sort of how that casting process played out. Well, that I was thinking about Joanna Ray, yeah. who was the casting director, a lot watching the scene that I was seeing. But I was struck by the distinctiveness of the faces. I mean, you know, yeah. the real mug. The cops are sensational. <laughs> Dennis mm -hmm. was in it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 
Yeah, and that's what hurt. You know, with the, the guy. But he got cut out. Because he's such a pain in the ass, right? <laughs> 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 but it was, you know, that was the guy that made those cars that would be around LA that had a lot of writing on them. And that was just so he's still out there, man. Yeah, out there. Yeah. I haven't seen yeah. him parked on the East here in Gower up by Paramount or something. But uh, then also Henry Rollins, you know, the yeah, cars. And the jailers. Yeah. The jailers, you know, Henry Rollins. And he, I thought that was a cool. And then just seeing him, and I thought, yeah, I don't think I realized when I was in it how what a perfect face yeah. he was for that. Yeah, Vaughn yeah. yeah. yeah, has been a great job. I yeah. think we've had two a lot of love for yeah, if you think back at, like the Twin Peaks television and also the Hall of Guy, people like Ann Miller, that's really Joanna. She she's had great ideas and and, and she really understands David's sensibility and has you know um, have worked a lot together. And um, she has this ability to come up, to come up with interesting ideas like Ann Miller, for example, in, in uh, um, the Hall of Guys, and um, you know all the fantastic actors and actresses in Twin Peaks. She, you know,
kind of leading them down a path that is like, okay, now something really strange is going to happen here, which I, clearly the whole scene in which you start to lose it in the jail cell, um, you know, prepares people for something, not exactly what they got. But. All right, well, since Phil has all the answers, <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, uh, let's read a little bit into the, into the film. Um, Patricia, you're, you're uh, discussion of the incarnation of, uh, of, of jealousy is, is one of the great, I think, uh, interpretations of Robert Blake and what this film is about. I've also heard it referred to as a collective nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I'm curious to know a little bit about what you guys feel this movie's about. Well, I came here to hear what it was. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? I mean, to be honest, you know, I remember having some similar theories. I mean, I remember it being a lot about relationships and also infidelity, jealousy. Um, but I, I have to be honest, you know, reading it, you never realized how scary it was going to be in a way. It didn't, it came off as, as you know, odd, as, as Lynchian, you know, as in, in the best way of the word. But I, I don't remember reading it thinking that this is going to be a thriller in the way that it is in terms of the, the scares and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I honestly, d I don't know that anybody could say exactly. It's sort of a stream of consciousness for me in some ways, like, like, like Mary said, you just kind of, one thing follows, uh, you know, the other, and it just kind of keeps moving forward in this kind of poetic way, I guess. I don't think there's like a really an answer. I also didn't think it was that scary as it came out. And I remember Robert Blake on the set, and it was before the whole murder trial of Robert Blake and all that stuff. And I remember he was saying, he goes, I think I'm not going to blink at all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. Um, but I, I didn't perceive that part being that scary either. And, you know, for me, and I, I like the fluidity of David's openness about, I remember at one point he was saying, like, yeah, there doesn't have to be, you know, we, we look at film, it's like a rectangle or something. It has these sides, and it has these limits, and it has these boundaries, the beginning, the middle, and the end of the story. And like he was like, why is there the front? And why is there the top and the bottom? And why is there the beginning, the middle, and the end? And there's a liberation in that. So even though I came up with, Something that helped me keep my sanity during shooting it, I don't know that that um, matters. I mean, I remember you, you know, being in, you know, <laughs> and you were like, you were going, this, this is the worst performance I've ever given in my life. I don't know what he's making me do. And I mean, you were really, I remember many times where you were really frightened by, like you were saying, that the w he's very specific about what he wants, how he wants you to say it. You know, I mean, everything is very much his vision and he pushed me so many times as an actor into a really uncomfortable place um, and it was always for the better but at the time sometimes it was hard hard to see it you know but you, you always grew because it wasn't uh, he's never really talked psychology at all so it wasn't it's never like the normal experience I mean, where you get what is your motivation, where are you coming from, what are you doing, it's nothing like that. So you can have other terms, if he had other terms, <laughs> I didn't do this thing, like he'd come up with, the, and remember but with the hallway stuff, he goes, so Bill, <laughs> you come to the hallway, you look down there, Is this her, his idea of who Renee really was? Is this Renee's past? 
I don't know, Church, what do you think? Because <laughs> <laughs> that OJ thing, I never uh, was, you know, uh, he would never talk about that. That would never be anything. No. But only in Catching the Big Fish, which was so, yeah. such a shock to me, having had it then yeah. off, you know, not on the table when we were doing the movie. Yeah. But then he gets, the, you know, Catching the Big Fish is his book, which has a lot of small vignettes about different things. But the one, they're small one-page paragraphs, really, about different things. But the one about Lost Highway was all about OJ. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, fuck, are you cast that? <laughs> 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 he watched the trial daily, and he was, you know, completely uh, absorbed in the whole process. And then he wrote. Yeah, you know, I know. But he wouldn't say it, you know, because there's too much information, and it, you know, um, you know, the thing that's interesting about his films is that he wants you to draw your own conclusions. So you can, your your perspective, your explanation is totally legitimate, and yeah. that's the interesting thing about his films is that he manages to put it up in a way that allows people to have their own interpretations and not be wrong. So it's interactive. Well, and that, as I remember at the time, because I had spent so much time in aesthetics, uh, you, you, you learn how to, you know, take the, the whole exploding head thing was an endless yeah. thing, and, and I, I think about it, because uh, they gave me the life mask, and for some reason we hung it in our garage, right, so the car comes in, <laughs> <laughs> life mask from that thing, but uh, that they, uh, that sense of um, of what it is, you know, when you cannot accept the fact that you're guilty, that you that you it you work it and work it and work it until you become somebody who could never be guilty of what you are accused of. So Fred Madison gets accused of murdering his wife, and he's a musician that's living in the basin of L.A., and then they go to the cell, and here is a person who could have never killed his wife because he's a mechanic from the valley, the exact <laughs> opposite of a musician from the basin. And so how could they hold a mechanic from the valley in jail? They had to let him go. But the thing is, you know, that that musician comes back. That's what this is. You know, and then again at the very end, you know, I don't accept that these poli these police are about to catch me. That was my my whole mm -hmm. thought was that my you know I have to go through another total trans. I have to change every molecule in my body so I become like OJ. I never I never did it, and you can say that without you're so compartmentalized. You know. I think that the definition of that being acute is someone who has commit, you know, uh, something is so traumatic and so horrifying, like murdering your wife, chopping her up, um, that your mind breaks and you create a new reality. I think, yeah, because, you know, Renee, who possibly was having an affair with, you know, Miss Dreddy Dickerman, and probably was a porn star before and hung out with that guy and all of that. But even in his dreams, even when he killed... Renee. Still, you know, he has to reinvent her. Oh, now he's this nice guy. And now the girl wants him. Now Alice wants him. All is going to be happy. No, because she's still a bitch whore. She's still a fucking bitch. <laughs> he fucking hates women so much. No matter what, they're fucking whores. No matter what, he cannot be the winner. He cannot be the guy. Because they're just so fucked up, he cannot kill her enough times. And then she says to him, you'll never have me. You want me, and want me, and want me, and yeah, we say that he's crazy if this is, you know, something real, but we're all crazy a little like that. You know, when you have a, a parting of a relationship, you, you keep reliving your relationship. You relive it in your mind, and you keep upset this, and why didn't you do that? Well, Fred just, you know, he makes people. <laughs> <laughs> he just feels a little brother. <laughs> I'm just flashing on the fact that we had blood all over us, and that, that was our real. You don't really see it in the. But remember how much time we spent in the bedroom? In the bedroom? Yeah. 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 <laughs>
gross too because all these body parts in it it felt weird it was it was like kind of like being in a crime scene like being like having to stop and be there but it felt it felt like it was my own crime scene it was creepy I was also just uh, while we were talking about production value, Patricia Norris. I thought it was another person uh, watching it that I had totally forgot about. But I was just thinking, like, how cool is this poster? You know, this this jacket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember seeing that jacket. <laughs> <laughs> Your parents' outfit. That's <laughs> <laughs> amazing. And your shoes. Every hair, like your your get your bathrobe on, kind of like get the paper and those giant shoes. <laughs> Patricia Norris also production guys designing costumes right. which isn't done that much anymore. Right. I don't know if anybody's doing that anymore. But that's mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. What was it like to work with Richard Pryor? I mean, was that role written for him? Um, I mean, I'm not sure if it was written for him. It it was surreal. Uh, you know, he was he was already ill, you know. Um but what a what an honor, what a privilege to to be around one of the greats of all time, in my opinion, you know. So just you know, I'm just happy to have, have had that and just remember that sweet man, you know, and, and but feeling feeling for his state is difficult to Yeah. Uh, you know, when you think of the owner's garage it wasn't harder to make a movie like this today than it was then? It is strange, you know, because so non-linear is so kind of, um, you know, a la mode. I mean, I'll go to cafe a little bit, but um, that's definitely, you know, this is, would not be something that would, you know, look at Memento or all that, you know, it, it wouldn't mess people up um, now like it did then. But, you know, but, but the real issue, one of the main issues for David, I think, um, was, I mean, um, securing final which no one, really almost no American character, independent or studio, would have given him, particularly with these scripts. And, you know, that's just not, at the time, what American uh, producers, financiers were interested in putting their money into. But, um, but really, you know, we found a really great um, financing relationship with first um, CD 2000 and then CBS now. Well, speaking of Firewalk with me, I'd just like to confirm to this audience that we will be doing the entire series of Twin Peaks next week. We'll be serving Jerry Pie and fine coffee. All right, let's take some questions from out here.